Hello and uh, welcome to this Google Hangout. Um, my name is Maria Bennett. I'm at STEC, which is uh, ESA's technical hub in Nordbeck in the Netherlands. And today we're going to have a hangout about robotics in uh, space missions. I'm joined today here at STEC by Matt Taylor, who's just left the screen. Here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in Houston we have Tim Peake. Um, Hi guys. Hello. Of course, ESA astronaut. And joining Tim is uh, Sarah Mooney, who is from the UK Science and Innovation Network. Hi, Sarah. If you'd like to tell us uh, a bit more about the Science and Innovation Network, please. Thanks, Maria. Uh, it's thrilling to be here at NASA's uh, Johnson Space Center. Um, and we're also delighted uh, that the Science and Innovation Network has been able to work with ESA on this Google Hangout. The, the British Science and Innovation Network is, is a global network uh, run by our Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, and Business Innovation and Skills Department. Our role is to, uh, to facilitate and develop science collaborations internationally. Um, we have a number of priorities, but for us, uh, over the coming years, priorities will be particularly be in uh, space and robotics and autonomy. So the uh, subject of this hangout is really exciting for us. Great, thank you. So uh, if I get on to um, our two uh, Hangout guests today. So um, Tim, thank you for taking some time out from your training. Um, yeah, tell us what you've been doing there in Houston. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> well, it's yeah, a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, in Houston, it's been a, a pretty crazy time. This year started with uh, a trip straight away to Japan. I'm training to be a specialist on the Japanese segment of the space station. And uh, back to Houston, I was in the uh, pool, the big swimming pool, the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory on Monday, practicing for some spacewalks, which may fall in our uh, increment timeline, timeline, and uh, doing emergency procedures as well with the not just the three crew, my Soyuz crew, but also the whole six crew on board the space station. So there's been some great training already this year. I'm off to Russia on Saturday for four weeks, where I'll be learning more about the Soyuz and also uh, having my first trip in the centrifuge over there in Star City, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, so yes, the launch is in November, 20th of November this year, and the time between now and then seems to be shortening rapidly. So it's going to be packed with some, some great training, uh, learning more about the science payloads that I'm going to be running on board the space station, and of course keeping refreshed on all of those skills that we need to, to, to learn and absorb in order to be good crew members on board the space station. Okay, great, thank you. And can I introduce you to uh, Matt Taylor, who's here next to me? Shall I do this? Uh, I don't believe the two of you have ever met. <laughs> Hi Tim. <laughs> Hi Matt. Uh, we haven't spoken before, um, so I'd firstly like to congratulate you on what has been and still is a fantastic Rosetta mission, and I'm delighted to be talking a bit more about that today. Yeah, it's uh, we, we're in. A, a, well, it's all happened last year, but now we're in the prime phase for me as a scientist. Uh, it's it's all to be had now. So it's uh, it's been a hectic time basically. Um, in terms of schedule, we had a crazy schedule last year. If we're talking about, you, you're looking forward to November uh, the 20th for, for your mission. This time last year, we'd just come out of hibernation, so we actually found out that we had a mission to work on. And in this, a similar time scale that you have this year, last year we characterized a comet and then landed on one. So it's, uh, I think our schedule was pretty similar to the hectic schedule that you have. <laughs> so good luck. Thanks very much. Okay, can I just add that um, if anybody who's watching online would like to join in the discussion, then uh, you're welcome to send your questions on Twitter to the hashtag robots in space, or you can post a question on the Google uh, event page for the Hangout. So, um, so Matt, where are we right now with Rosetta? Well, I guess I've given a, a brief overview. Um, we, as I said, we came out of hibernation um, in January last year. Uh, in August last year, we rendezvoused with the comet, so we got within 100 kilometers of the comet. And uh, if you didn't realize, we were uh, we were able to land on the comet well, more than once uh, with the Philae lander in November last year. Since then, we put the orbiter into orbit around the comet uh, around 20 kilometers. Then we've moved out to 28 kilometers now. By the end of this month, we'll actually move away from bound orbit. So the, the outgassing of the comet is thought to be 
greater at that time than the, the, than the gravitational attraction between the spacecraft and the comet. So it will push us out and we'll start flying these very strange trajectories. We'll actually do a flyby uh, on Valentine's Day, uh, it's currently planned, where we'll get within six kilometers of the surface of the comet. I mean, it's actually quite nauseating when you look at the, uh, the field of view. So when we run through the simulations, it's going to be a, a, a bit of a wild ride, that one. And in the subsequent months, we'll be getting further away, just driven by the, the activity of the comet. And this is one of the major issues for us with Rosetta, is trying to put the spacecraft as close as possible to a body that's trying to push you away all the time. So that's the constant battle and um, issues that we have all the time with, with having something that far away as well. It takes about half an hour for a, a signal to get to the spacecraft, and again, another half an hour to get back. So there's a lot of autonomy involved in this. And... It, it's, it's a challenge, but this year is now where we're doing all the science, and, and that's, uh, I guess, exemplified by last week where we had a major issue of uh, some of the first results from the, the Rosetta mission, you know, really characterizing this comet, and we're starting to understand how it works, and we will do through this year, through August this year, when we get to closest approach, the comet gets closest to the sun, becomes massively active, and we're there at ringside sea, and it's uh, all to be had and enjoyed by everyone. And that's brilliant, Matt. And I mean, I remember last year, um, as you said, this time last year, the wake up of Rosetta, and there was the, the big campaign, and and that was you know incredible to watch and be part of. And to, when we got that signal back from uh, Rosetta that it had come out of hibernation successfully, um, but but also just you know that was a, a culmination of a ten year journey, and uh, it was incredible to read that you know, Rosetta has done I think what three flybys of the Earth and one flyby of Mars on its journey and photographed other comets on the way. Um, so it, it's been an incredible mission um, for this whole time period. Uh, something I was going to ask you was, there have been so many highlights from the, the wake up, the fillet land of the flybys. What has been the most exciting part of the Rosetta mission from your point of view? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I'd have to say in hindsight, in terms of excitement, it still has to be the hibernation exit because we went from knowing absolutely nothing about the spacecraft, whether it was even there, to knowing that it was there. Uh, anything else in between that, yeah, there was there was a lot of uh, tension during the rendezvous manoeuvre. That was exponential uh, when we reached the, the, the lander deployment. But for me, it's still the hibernation exit. That's going from you've got a job to not having a job kind of thing. <laughs> it's the, yeah. If you get the spacecraft back, that, that, that was the end of the mission. So it was really the, the, the first steps to what we've achieved now, in hindsight. Yeah, and, and is that pretty much the first time that that's been tried for such a long hibernation period? I think in terms of extent, yes. We've done it before. We did some tests with Rosetta. I think Giotto, the Giotto our first kind of cometary mission, deep space mission, went into hibernation as well. And a number of our spacecraft uh, around the Earth do this as well. A, a spacecraft that I worked on for many years, it's probably behind my head, this four spacecraft mission here, cluster, kind of goes into hibernation every time it goes behind the Earth because the batteries have run out on the spacecraft, so we have to put it in a certain situation so it goes to sleep in the shadow of the Earth and then comes back to life again uh, when it can see the sun again. So it's a non-nominal operation, but it's something that certainly we uh, at ESA are, are used to doing. But it's not um, without uh, nervousness that we do it. Excellent. Um, something else, the, uh, about these flybys, I'm interested as well. I, I, the space station's going around in low Earth orbit at about 17,500 miles an hour. I'm not sure if you know the answer to this question, but I was thinking with all of those flybys, on, on the final Earth flyby, when I think it was about five or 6,000 kilometers away from the Earth, what sort of speed was Rosetta traveling at on that final flyby? Oh, you've got me there. You could probably do it from working out because you're at 400 there. So you'd, I, I couldn't think it off the top of my head, to be honest with you. But, but, but I, I mean, it must it must be going incredibly fast at that point, and then it's yeah. going to go off on its uh, five kilometer, uh, sorry, five million kilometer journey to, to Rosetta. I think it's tens of kilometers a second. It should be going then. Um, I know, but yeah. when again, again from cluster, when we started going closer and closer to the Earth. We hadn't expected the mission to do that. It was extended for a number of uh, years. And so we hadn't expected the, the mission to get that close to the Earth, so it wasn't going that fast. And in fact, we never thought that we'd have to deal with uh, three digits in speed. <laughs> so yeah. we had a problem where when we went above 10, we couldn't read it properly. So we had to modify some of our software to en enable us to be able to read out what the, uh, what the speeds were doing. But, uh, but that's yeah. one of the things you can do, I guess, with uh, software. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I find it incredible. I mean, thankfully, I'm not a rocket scientist, just a, a lowly astronaut. But, uh, the, you know, how you guys actually manage to work out what's going on and do all the calculations. I mean, as you, as you said there at the moment, you're adjusting Rosetta's orbit from 20 to 28 kilometers based on, on the off-gassing of a comet. How on earth do you even calculate the off-gassing of a comet and how to judge the, the orbital dynamics to keep Rosetta in place? Uh, it is, I mean, well, you say about rocket science, but you're the person that rides the rocket, so I know I wouldn't want to be in your place <laughs> at all. Um, but it's down to the, to the people. The, the, there's a special breed of people that exist on, on, on this planet, and uh, within ESA, they exist around the Darmstadt area in ESOC, and, and those are the people in flight dynamics who, who make this stuff up <laughs> or calculate it. They don't make it up. They, they're the ones who calculate how all this works. So when you look, as you're alluding to, this 10-year journey that brought us from the Earth's orbit way, way out to near, near the orbit uh, of uh, Jupiter was all calculated and all planned. So we, we, we did those flybys, as you alluded to. We flew past two asteroids and then got within a few thousand kilometers of, of the comet is is fantastic. So, you know, it, it goes to show that maths is pretty useful. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. I, I also remember that, the, you know, the Rosetta is um, shedding, as it gets close to the sun, an awful lot of water. Um, is, is that expected? Is it the, the sort of quantities that we expect? What, what are we learning about Rosetta as it gets closer to the sun? Well, um, I think you're, you're alluding to the, the, the comet itself, which uh, yes, is 67 yeah. So Chur churimov Um it's, it's expected, certainly. We were measuring it uh, very early on, and we actually had a really nice uh, measurement from the equivalent of the distance from the Earth to the moon. So this, this measurement was a bit like if you went to your back garden and looked at the moon, and could measure two small cups, you know, this 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 called kind of size cup um, mm. of water coming off per second. So that was in about May time uh, frame last year. That went up to liters per second. Now we, we are liters to tens of liters a second. And this mass outflow, so it's both water and also par particles, dust, also CO2. There's all different types of ice coming off and sublimating, changing into gas. It's how a comet works and why we want to understand more about how a comet works and why comets are fascinating. That They have this dynamic uh, that we, we need to find out how that works. And the, the stuff that's coming off is the interesting stuff. That's stuff that's been locked into these bodies since the beginning of the solar system. And that's why we're there, to work out how a comet works, but also see what it's made of. And that gives us an idea of where we came from and how the solar system has evolved to the, the situation that we have today. But again, it's um, it's a challenge to enable a robot to get close to this object and allow us to do this science. Yeah, absolutely incredible. I find it fascinating. Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks, Tim. Okay, if I can if I can throw you a question that we've had on uh, social media as well. Yes. So um, it's uh, Ryan Lard. He's led. He's Thanks asking led. Yes. led sorry. <laughs> he's asking if there's any news on the harpoons of Philae. Uh, he's saying reports or perhaps that they did not fire. Is it confirmed? Um, we are awaiting uh, a more official analysis of exactly the a, a timeline of what went on uh, la leading to the landing and subsequent landings. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, the harpoons didn't uh, fire. That's that's my understanding. Originally, we thought they had, but it depends. Again, it, it, this is the issue with having these. Uh, robots, you have to understand the language that they're sending down. And it was just a, a miscommunication between a couple of people as to which parameter we were looking at at the time. And again, when you're caught up in the heat of the moment. But it looks like they weren't deployed. Uh, one of the parameters showed that something else happened, but it's more to do with a subsequent operation within the system. But it didn't look like that they were deployed now. Yeah. Which I have to say, in hindsight, may have been good because the, the measurements we were making after the first landing. Um, and also, from what we see from the first landing, it appears that the, the upper layer of the comet was, is quite soft, maybe, but it's only a few centimetres deep, tens of centimetres, and there's a very hard surface layer underneath, subsurface layer. So maybe, we don't know. Again, I'm a, I'm a glasses half full person, so if the harpoons had fired, they may have fired and not actually penetrated if, it, if the subsurface was hard enough. And from Newton's laws, we would have ended up with two orbiters. So that's my story. I'm sticking with it. So it was a good thing. And we got th we got three spots across the comet to uh, sample scientifically. So. That's so true. Yeah, yeah. I think you had a you had a question for Tim as well. Oh yeah, actually, yeah. Um, I, I was involved in um, 
an, an interaction to do with the, uh, this was Paolo Nespoli, these uh, zero robotic sphere program where we, we had students from around the world programming the spheres that you have on board the International Space Station. Uh, and the question is, uh, what, what are the, the challenges uh, with kind of operating in a confined space with uh, a robot like that, so a human interacting with uh, a robot in, in a small space? Yeah, and in fact, I, I just saw on the uh, websites uh, as well last week. That, you know, they had the zero robotics competition going on, and um, and Terry and Samantha Cristoforetti on board the space station were involved with that as well. Um, it's a great competition that one, and it gets students involved in writing code for these um, spheres robots uh, on board the space station that can then uh, do all sorts of tasks like running around an obstacle course using minimal minimal propulsion techniques and sometimes have to do other, other tasks involved. So, I mean, in a confined space in zero gravity, yes, you have to be very cautious when working with robotics. And on board the space station at the moment, we have Robonaut 2, who is getting ever more sophisticated. He's gone from being just arms to now arms and, and legs. And uh, future iterations will see Robonaut actually go from inside the space station, hopefully, to outside the space station and, and assisting with EVA tasks. So it's very important that you know humans and robots can work together in close confined areas and to do those tasks correctly. But that's the beauty of robotics is all you need are a few sensors with of course some redundancy and backup and, and robots can be extremely capable in knowing exactly where they are and knowing where the humans are and therefore building in these kind of safety constraints that allow robots and humans to work together in very confined spaces and, and robots you know bring with them the ability to uh, have greater endurance greater strength and even in some cases you know greater fidelity which you wouldn't necessarily expect from a robot but when an astronaut is wearing those big EVA gloves uh, we actually have reduced fidelity, so get a get a robot outside the space station to help with some EVA tasks, and they can get into really confined areas that perhaps astronauts in bulky spacesuits with big gloves can't get into. So you know that they're the kind of things we're working to, which is is all great stuff. And the zero robotics challenges really help you know the students to get an idea of what's going on, and hopefully they'll be the next generation of engineers that will be working on these problems. Yeah, they were certainly uh, highly engaged in that. It was a, it was a really fun, a really fun competition. I'd like to see that again. Yeah. I think Sarah uh, had a question as well. Uh, yes, it's a question first for Matt. Um, what's what's the next what's the next big adventure for robotics in space? I mean, for me, within uh, the, the environment that I'm in, the the, the robotics and uh, science and robotic exploration part of ESA. We have a number of missions in, in, in progress. Actually, this week we have the Bepi Colombo science team a meeting. This is a mission going to Mercury in a, in a, in a number of years. We also have the Juice uh, team uh, meeting this, this, this week, uh, going to one of the outer planets, going to Jupiter. So for me, that they're, they're the next big uh, mission scientifically. Um, I'm, to be honest with you, my head is stuck in the Rosetta sand at the moment. <laughs> I can't see further than that. Uh, but, but scientifically, that that's the, that's the the direction we see uh, me, me personally going. And of course, at the ExoMars project, uh, we're on the, the the cusp of the next stage uh, of uh, Mars exploration from an ESA perspective as well. So it's all going on at the moment. So yeah, there's a number of things in the pipeline in terms of that that level of exploration. Of course, we have other spacecraft uh, being planned, which have uh, different scientific goals, but for me the ones that go and touch and, and, and orbit around planetary bodies, they're, they're, they're the, the next ones um, in terms of, from, from an ESA perspective. Matt, will you be working on the ExoMars project? Um, not as I, not, I, I don't consider that I will at the moment, no. As I say, I am 356.5% uh, Rosetta at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand why. And, and how will Rosetta actually terminate its mission? I mean, will it just be a case of it'll get too close to the sun and the systems will start degrading, performance degrading? Um, actually, that's a, an interesting question. It's something that we're discussing at the moment. The, the mission was designed to get uh, to, to escort the comet, to ride alongside the comet as the comet gets through its closest approach to the sun, which is about 1.2 astronomical units, so it's a bit, bit further than the Earth and uh, towards Mars. That will happen in August this year. We will then start trading the comet as it goes further away from the, from the sun 
till the end of this year at the moment. That's that's where we're funded to. We are considering making a proposal to extend the mission as long as we can. The main constraints there are fuel and also power. We will get to a situation later in 2016, and then in the latter half towards autumn or fall, uh, where we're so far away from the sun that we're not getting enough power to the system. So in principle, we would have to put the spacecraft into hibernation. But likely before that, depending on how we run things, we'll start to run out of fuel. And the discussion at the moment, or I think the, what we're most of us are, are thinking of doing, is to actually spiral the spacecraft, so Rosetta, into the comet itself. So we'll have another landing. And this will provide us with some fantastic science uh, observations because we'll get as close as we can with the orbiter as well, which is something that, that, that is key to the science behind understanding uh, comets. So it's part of an ongoing uh, set of uh, discussions within the science team, the operations team, how we would achieve that. But for me, it's a, it's a fitting finale for uh, Rosetta. Oh, incredible. And, and it, what about the Philae lander? Is there still some hope that that might uh, come back to life uh, with the extra solar uh, panel energized as it gets close to the sun? Um, yes, that's, that, that's what I say. Uh, I, I'm very hopeful. That's that. yeah. just, just, just as you say, it'll get close to the sun. We'll actually get, so here's a comment I prepared earlier. <laughs> um, it's kind of the lander somewhere around here on, on, on the side of the duck's head. And as, we, as the orbit evolves around the sun, that part of the comet will come more into, and it's actually uh, shown quite well with the, the reflection from my light here, that part of the comet will become more illuminated. So there's a seasonal effect as the comet goes around the sun. So that part of the comet will become more illuminated. We then expect the the, the lander to receive more light, more, more energy, and also we, the comet's getting closer to the sun. So it's also tilting in the right direction and getting closer to the sun, which are all pluses if you're trying to get more energy driven from a solar generator uh, on a lander that's kind of lying on its side in a ditch uh, with a bit of shadow at the moment. But we hope to get much better illumination as you're alluding to. So, yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly be keeping my fingers crossed, as I'm sure many other people will as well. Okay. Um, and, and how about you, Tim? I, I understand that you, you've also done uh, training on the, on, for example, on the Canadian robotic arm, and I think also in Japan. How is it actually? to be the one at the controls of a, of a, of a robotic arm. It's great. Um, I mean, yeah, the ro robotic arm is just uh, so vital to space station operations. It, it uh, captures our visiting vehicles like the uh, HTV and the, the Dragon and uh, Cygnus, the, the new commercial cargo vehicles. And it also helps uh, astronauts on spacewalks without the robotic arm. You know, we couldn't move those big heavy modules around. Of course, they're weightlessness, but they still have a lot of mass. And you have to be very concerned about the mass when you're moving big things around in space. So the robotic arm is vital to, uh, to assist us in that. And um, to practice those operations is great. I mean, capturing uh, a, a free-floating visiting vehicle is a high-pressure task. And it's something that we train for. Um, but it's also going to be you know, an enormous privilege to actually get the opportunity to do that. Um, and uh, I've heard that the actual robotic arm in space is a little bit different to how we train. There's a, a little bit more sort of motion. And uh, at the end of the arm, it's moving around. For example, if you stop the robotic arm quite abruptly, you'll get a large wobble on the end of the arm, which we, you need to be careful of. So astronauts actually train in space with the real robotic arm before actually doing these tasks as well. I guess it must be difficult to um, replicate that on the ground. That this this lack of drag that you would you'd see here if you have a robot uh, that that must be one of the issues, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And you know the simulators on the ground are as as good as they can be, and they've tried to replicate that. But the the astronauts, you know, do tend to tend to say that it's just slightly different in space. Yeah, that's why you've got to be there. <laughs> that's why you've got to get out there. <laughs> could, could I ask what what are the contingency plans if? A robotic arm, for example, breaks down. Um, it's funny, actually. It, just by chance, I was in the pool on Monday doing exactly that um, with my uh, crewmate, Tim Copra. And we were doing a, a practice spacewalk for repairing the robotic arm. Um, and we actually have spare parts that are outside the space station on um, cargo carriers, if you like. And our job on Monday was to remove part of the robotic arm 
and then replace it, which is, is quite a demanding task because, of course, you don't have the arm to help you, right. so everything has to be done manually. Um, but uh, we really, the contingency is to repair and uh, replace the robotic arm to get it serviceable again. Of course, if you lost the robotic arm for a long period of time, we'd have to re um, rely on the resupply vehicles that actually can dock themselves, like the Progress and the ATV. Right. And for example, how long did that repair take on Monday in the pool? Uh, that, we were six hours in the pool, but um, you'd normally do that over two EVAs, two spacewalks. Okay. Thank you. And how similar is the buoyancy lab to being in space? What, what, what are the guys say? Uh, yeah, so I have to go off, off <laughs> uh, you know, comments from my experienced colleagues who've been there, but um, water is great for you know, giving you that neutral buoyancy, but the extra viscosity of water means that it's, it's very hard to get things moving mm. and very easy to stop them. And in space, it's completely the opposite. You know, it's very easy to get something moving, and if it's got a large amount of mass, it's very hard to get it to stop. Hence the wobble. Um, hence the wobble. And um, the pool is extremely demanding and tiring, and, mm. and you know, after six hours in the pool, you really feel it. But the, you know, again, my colleagues say that actually space is demanding in other ways, so I think they do compare quite well. Um, and things that are very frustrating in the pool because they're not realistic, mm -hmm. well, you'll also get frustrated in space by the, the realities of the mission. Um, for example, you can kind of cheat in the pool. If you, if you let go, the water will keep you where you are. In space, you know, you'll just rotate and turn so quickly and so easily that um, before you know it, you'll be upside down and can get easily disorientated. So it, it's slightly different, but it's the best we can do. And final question for me, I think, which is um, in your program for when you're uh, on the International Space Station, do you have any specific robotic projects that you're looking at? Um, well, using the robotic arm, definitely. We're yeah. um, hoping to have a, possibly an HTV, uh, two, maybe three SpaceX vehicles, maybe an orbital vehicle. So um, probably doing quite a few captures of, of resupply vehicles. Right. Um, and we'll hopefully be getting involved in the zero robotics competition as well. That will, that's an ongoing competition, so we hope to do that. Robonaut will continue to be active, so I'm sure there'll be some Robonaut tasks as well. Um, and in, in my mission as well, I'm running a, a competition on a much score, smaller scale um, called Astro Pi, which is using these Raspberry Pi computers with a whole bunch of sensors on them and leaving it up to students to uh, come up with all sorts of ideas that they can think of using these accelerometers, right. infrared cameras, visual cameras, temperature, humidity, pressure, all the rest of it. Um, so again, it's kind of like zero robotics, engaging students in robotics and coding. I think that's an excellent. I really look forward to that. I have a final question for Matt as well, and that's, Matt, what aspects of artificial intelligence are you utilizing for robots at the moment? Well, I mean, as I was alluding to before, Rosetta is, uh, is very far away. It takes about half an hour for light to get to the spacecraft, so our signals take a long time. So there is a heavy, a, a very large amount of autonomy involved in carrying out this mission. So the spacecraft has to cope with being around this object that's trying to push it away all the time. It's got navigation cameras that track where the comet is in a certain field of view to monitor where we, we are traveling, what the effects of this outgassing are. So it will monitor the comet. Then it will say to itself, now I know that in a certain amount of time I should be in this position when it gets there and does another navigation and it has to then say, well, am I in the right place? Now, if that, there's a large error, so I think it's something like about two and a half degrees in terms of error of where the navigation camera should be pointing, mm. it will get worried. And then if, it's, if a subsequent step happens and that happens again, we'll, we'll go to a contingency scenario where the spacecraft will move away from the comet because it's not navigating to the level of accuracy that's required uh, by the, 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 the mission control uh, uh, Team in uh, in Eastlock in Darmstadt. So this is this is one of the things that you have to have that autonomy on board to enable you to be able to cope with uh, such an, an extreme environment. And this is the issue again. Going back to fixing things, you can fix things if you can get to them. So one of the the problems we have with space travel is trying to make things as robust as possible because sometimes you can't go and get your hands on and, and tweak things. Uh, and, that, and that's why space, space, space missions take so long to build and, and, and you have to check so many things. We, we had a, an experience on, on the cluster spacecraft where about five of the instruments uh, switched off because something was switched on and we couldn't turn it off. So there was a piece of hardware that, that was switched in a certain way that the instruments couldn't work anymore and it put, this, put the spacecraft in, in a particular situation. And 
through the knowledge and the hard work of uh, certain people in the in the mission control center in ESOL, they were looking through these binders that are that thick, looking at all the code that has to go through the, the system. And they actually had managed to find a piece of code, a way of getting round a nominal procedure, which they call a dirty hack. Uh, you can Google it, cluster dirty hack, and you'll see it, see, we'll see what happened. So they basically squeezed in two commands in, in the time that one command would get in, and that worked, and it flipped a switch, and everything started to work again. But that's the issue, that hardware is difficult to fix. Software is even is less difficult, but you have to be able to um, take that on board when, when you're flying uh, missions that far away that you, ca you can't get to. Uh, so you have a benefit in, in that sense with the ISS that you can you can get up there and maybe tweak certain things, but once you go further away, it's it's more difficult. I think there's a some there is a rumor that the, for the James Webb Space Telescope, even though it's not in Earth orbit, somebody was joking that they were going to put one of these arrestor hooks on, like you have on Hubble, that a, a, an astronaut could go up and fix something. But seeing as it's going very far away from the Earth, I don't think that's actually going to be uh, implemented. But who knows? Maybe <laughs> maybe Tim might have to go and fix something. I think you might be right. You might be writing me out of a future job. There, I'd, I'd love to go to L two and <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> No, no. I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe that's maybe it's still there. <laughs> but that would be a that would be some journey, I think. Okay, I have a couple more questions from uh, from social media. So uh, this one's for you, Matt. Uh, no bones, Jones. I think you alluded to it earlier, but they were asking about uh, as the comet gets closer to the sun, is it possible that Philae's solar panels start working? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is this is basically what we are, we're waiting for. We uh, cannot do anything. We are waiting for uh, Philae to come back to life. This is something it was designed to do. It was designed to go through separation, descent, and landing, first science sequence, and then go into hibernation. Because of where it is, the hibernation is much longer, and we haven't got a very accurate fix at the moment. There are ongoing studies to find out exactly when, or a better window of when the amount of energy, as, as Tim had asked before uh, and, and, and pointed out, we get closer to the sun, it should get more illumination, and we should get it back. But it's it's up to the lander and the sun and the conditions on the comet to uh, to get itself back. Okay. And uh, I think this one's for you, Tim. Uh, Simon Rose. He says, "Do you think?" Human exploration makes sense. For example, when Mars rove, when rovers and probes work well, and this is safer. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's a great question, and uh, we could we could have another two and a half, three hours. Who knows, discussing this topic? But I, of course, I think human exploration makes sense, and uh, I think that humans need to work closely with robots and use the strengths and efficiencies of. of of robots where they can be applied and then humans when they can be applied. I mean, for example, robots are great at, uh, as we said already, you doing perhaps repetitive tasks of um, doing, th of making a mission safer, going to places first, exploring where humans can follow, where they can't follow, etc. But uh, ultimately, I think the aim of, of space exploration in my mind is that humans will follow uh, in terms of uh, potential colonization of, of the solar system. Um, something I think is very important to do. So yes, we can always learn from robots, and robotic missions are precursors to human exploration, and they're a huge and vital, important part of human exploration as well. But I think it's necessary to back that up with human exploration as, as well. Okay, great. Yeah, I think I, feel like I, I fully agree. You know, perhaps people in my directorate would uh, disagree, because I'm supposed to be a robotic explorer. but. I think that's it. We can put them in places first where you might not want to put a human to find out whether you can put a human there. And then we get heroes like Tim, who are, for me, historically we've always had a, a, an exploration uh, in, in us as humans, and that's, that's who Tim and his colleagues represent. So uh, Samantha and everyone else on the ISS now are our, our explorers, the ones that are breaking down these boundaries to, to find other places, to go to new, new, it used to be new continents or new islands or new places on a ship, now, now we're sending people into space and it's vitally important for us to carry on doing this, otherwise, yeah, it's, uh, it would be exciting and, uh, and it's thanks to people like Tim who have uh, got the right stuff. I, I mean, I, I think also as well, you, when, you, when you put human ingenuity um, onto a, a surface, you know, a planetary surface, then there, there's no end to what we can do, and we could learn a huge amount in a short space of time. Um, I mean, the uh, the Apollo, just on the Apollo 17 mission, those guys covered 22 miles in three days, 
and that took the Curiosity rover, uh, sorry, the Opportunity rover, it took eight years to cover the same distance. So it gives you an idea of what you know humans can do when they're there and just taking the human brain to these other planets and our ingenuity and our decision-making skills. Um, yes, it's more expensive. Yes, there's greater risk to human life. But ultimately, I think it's the right way to go. OK, great. Well, I think we're going to wrap up now. So um, it's been a great discussion, very interesting from, uh, from both of you. Very, uh, very educational for me as well. So. <laughs> So I'd just like to thank you, Tim, for, for taking some time out from your busy schedule to join us. It's, uh, it's been good. Let's yeah. drag him out of the pool. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. It's great yeah. to meet you, Tim. Uh, you too, Matt. Hope to do it in person, by the way. Good luck with the rest of the mission. I, I look forward to following it from here. Well, and, and the same to you as well. Good luck. All the best. OK. And, uh, and um, also to uh, Sarah for joining us. Uh, thank you very much. It has been very educational, as you say. Can I also thank NASA's Johnson Space Centre for hosting us here? Yeah, thanks for nice as well. And uh, lastly, Matt, thank you for your time as well. And uh, good luck Pleasure. with the next steps for Rosetta. Yeah, everyone stay tuned. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.